chair has not turned up, so I think we'll just make a start. And, uh, um, so welcome to the data acquisition uh, presentations for this afternoon. Um, if I could welcome, or if everyone could welcome, is it Alexia? Yeah. To, the, to the lectern um, to present on her presentation. Thanks, Alexia. Thank you. To like exit this part and then go into the other. Touch your name. Touch your name. With the mouse. Oh, there's the mouse. Oh, how about that? Thank you. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to my talk. Um, my name is Alexia, and I'm a junior research fellow at IMAS at UTAS. And I'm here to talk to you today about a paper that was just published this morning uh, about how citizen science aids the quantification of the distribution and prediction of present and future, thank you for the applause, uh, temporal variation and habitat suitability at species range edges. So we've heard a lot this week about uh, Rec Fisher engagement, Rec Fisher stewardship, and citizen science. And I'm here to talk to you today about how that um, data can be used to ask some pretty cool questions. So citizen science is increasing in popularity because it's a really effective method to collect large volumes of data and assist in monitoring of ecological environments. As species are shifting their distributions globally, the use of citizen science to detect, to detect these shifts is increasing. And this data is really useful for things like species distribution modeling. And these are correlative models that predict the where and the when of these species redistributions. And a really successful program in Australia in the marine realm is that of the Range Extending Database and Mapping Project. Greta gave a really great overview of this earlier today. Um, and basically, it's a program by which fisher or non-fisher, if you found a species that you think is outside of its historical range, you can take a photo of it, upload it onto the RedMap website. That image gets validated by an expert. Um, and if it's a true detection, that gets put into um, the, data, the database. And as such, it's been really successful and it has informed a lot of really great science around Australia. So for those of you who aren't from here, a brief overview of climate change in this part of the world. Um, so this is the east coast of Australia. You have the eastern Australian current um, running down the east coast. And as things continue to warm, this is bringing on the southern range extension of the eastern Australian current, bringing warm water off the coast to Tasmania. And as such, this region has more records of range-shifting species than any other region of Australia's surrounding ocean. And the species that we were really interested in was that of King George Whiting and Snapper, due to its high recreational value. And we know through programs like RedMap that the frequency by which fishers are encountering these species is, is increasing. But what we were really interested in is a little bit more targeted, in, targeted information about these two species. So thus was born the Tassie Fish Frame Collection Program. It was formally launched in 2019, and it was really instrumental. Um, Dave was really instrumental in this formal launch. He was our senior tech officer at the time, and he gave a really great talk about this yesterday. Um, and basically, it's a network of 16 drop-off locations by which any fisher who has caught the species that we're looking for um, have taken the fillets off, and they can drop off what would normally be tossed into the bin at one of these drop-off locations, and then our staff can pick them up and can conduct all sorts of biological analysis to get some really valuable information. It's uh, managed through social media, primarily uh, Facebook. Um, but I did want to preface this, that prior to its formal launch in 2019, IMS has had a really strong ongoing relationship with the wreck fishing community. And this relationship has been really fundamental in supporting a lot of great science for decades. And so I was hired on under this project to build some species distribution models, or SDMs, to predict the southern range extension of Snapper and King George Whiting. And so they're really cool models. They predict historical, current, and future distributions of suitable habitat. They do this by matching individual occurrence records to environmental predictors um, in space and time. So you know that this fish was caught at this place, at this time, it was this warm, it was this saline, the currents were doing this, the moon was doing this, whatever you're interested in. And then you can start to develop a habitat suitability map. And that's what you see here. This is one of Kurt Champion's uh, habitat suitability models uh, for yellowtail kingfish. 
And once you build this habitat suitability map, you can calculate things like range shifts, distances between range edges, use of core habitat, area of core habitat, what have you. And due to their versatility, they're used broadly in terrestrial systems and increasingly in marine systems. But they do require large databases of occurrence records. And so I was hired on, I was learning all about SDMs, and a question that popped into my mind is, as you have an increased resolution of occurrence records at the range edge, how does this influence the spatial predictions um, by SDMs um, having this increased resolution? And that was the aim of this, this study here. There was two primary objectives. The first was to quantify the contribution of citizen science initiatives strategically operating at the range edge to improve our understanding of species distributions at their limits. So are, they, are these targeted citizen science programs doing a good job? And then the second one was to compare spatial predictions of habitat suitability for snapper and King George Whiting at their poleward range edges using SDMs that did and didn't use um, S, uh, citizen science at the range edge. So to build our um, SDMs, we used a variety of different data sources. The first and the largest was that of the Atlas of Living Australia, which is a conglomeration of all sorts of data sources ranging from natural history collections, government departments, universities and research, and community groups. Um, it operates Australia-wide. Because we can't validate each occurrence record, the quality of the data is unknown, but it is open access and it provides us with a lot of occurrence records. We also use data from Reef Life Survey, which is a citizen science um, program operating worldwide where highly drained divers conduct standardized underwater visual census. We know the quality of the data is high. It is free to use, open access, and has relatively fewer occurrence records useful for our SDMs. We also use data from REDMAP, which is citizen science at the range edge. We know the data quality is high, costs a little bit of money to run in-house, and relatively few occurrence records useful for this particular study. And then we used um, data from the Tassie Fish Frame Collection Program, citizen science at the range edge. We know the quality is high, costs a bit of money to run in-house, but relatively a lot of occurrence records useful for us because it was targeted for this purpose. And then we supplemented the data set at the range edge by doing fishery independent sampling to account for size and location biases that you know, account for uh, minimum legal size limits and harder access locations. We know the quality is high, it costs a lot of money because we have quite high salaries and um, produce relatively few occurrence records. So once you have all of your data sources, you can start to build your SDM. So here we have um, the occurrence records mapped for Snapper and King George Whiting. The pink dots are the occurrence records and then the gray dots, oh, well, I'm gonna be brave, the gray dots. Um, are pseudo absence points. So the occurrence records tell us where habitat is suitable, and then you gotta tell the model where habitat isn't suitable. So that's what your pseudo absence points do. Once you've generated those, you can start to overlay your environmental predictors. So here we have depth and sea surface, sea surface temperature, which we know are strong predictors of occurrence for these guys. Um, and we also know that King George Whiting is highly habitat associated to seagrass, so we um, generated a raster by calculating the distance to known seagrass habitat from the Open Access CMAP Australia data set. Once that's all kind of done, you can stack them all on top of each other and start to build your model. Um, but prior to doing this, you do need to do a few data checking steps. So I talked about pseudo absences. We also looked at autocorrelation between data points because we are um, collecting a lot of different data from a lot of different sources. So to account for autocorrelation, you thin the data through space and time and you see if you've done a good job by looking at semivariograms. We also look at things like correlation and collinearity amongst predictors. And once all that's good to go, we can start to, bring, start to build our generalized additive mixed effects models. We pick the best one and then we apply k-fold cross-validations to see if the model does a good job at predicting subsets of its own data. So I thought for my first postdoc, I was you know, doing really sexy science, climate change, rage edge, modeling, and I'd be doing a lot of this. But in fact, I spent a lot of months doing this. But nevertheless, with a lot of help from Barrett, who's in the audience, um, we came up with our best model. And so we wanted to compare predictions of the GAM that did use citizen science at the range edge and the outputs of the GAM that didn't include these data sources. So looking at the spatial contribution of these data sources, here we have Snapper, um, the different colors of the different data sources, highlighting that purple is Atlas of Living Australia and yellow is a Tassie Fish Frame Collection program. The first column of graphs is the entire data set and the second column of graphs 
is the data that the model used after you thinned it through space and time. Then we have the data across the Australian domain and then data across the Tasmanian domain or the range edge. And when you split this up a little bit, you can see across the Australian domain, noting that we know that snapper occur further than Bundaberg. Um, if you have questions about that, ask me later. We chose a cutoff distance for these models. But the open access repository or the Atlas of Living Australia accounted for the majority of the data that the model used and the entire data set. But when you hone in on the range edge, it's actually the Tassie Fish Frame Collection program that's accounting for the majority of the data used in the model and in the data set. And combined with the red map data, it increases the volume of available data by 2.3% and the extent of available data compared to these open access repositories by 277.7 kilometers south. So effectively, good bang for buck. Similar story for King George Whiting, same setup across the entire Australian domain. The Tassie Fish Frame Collection Program accounted for just over half uh, across the entire data set, but when you thin that data down, it's actually the Atlas of Living Australia again, accounting for the majority of the data used. But when you focus in on Tassie only or the range edge, um, it's the Tassie Fish Frame Collection Program accounting for the majority of the occurrence records increasing the volume of available data by 52.7% and the extent of available data compared to open access repositories by 437.9 kilometers south. So really good investment. So how does this increase in occurrence at the range edge affect YAR SDM? So these are just the partial effects plots of our best model. And once you have those, you know how wiggly the lines are, you can apply your environmental predictors and map it in terms of a habitat suitability index. And this is for snapper in the summertime with the GAM that used um, citizen science at the range edge. And this is the output of the GAM that didn't. And I don't know if it's very easy to see, um, but the one that didn't is a little bit darker. And so to calculate this, because it is really hard to see, uh, we stack the rasters on top of each other and subtract the grid cells to look at change. And that's what you see here. So this is Snapper. This is on the southern east coast of Tasmania, so the true range edge. Um, the darker the red, the more the change. And then the data points here are the data points contributing to the model. And you can see that it's Red Map Research and the Tassie Fish Frame Collection program only. So nothing from Atlas of Living Australia um, contributing to these spatial predictions. And when you calculate the change across the entire state, the model that used citizen science at the range edge predicted on average 9 to 31% higher uh, habitat suitability. And when you look at this at average proportional increase per grid cell, ranged from 39 to 65% between the winter and the summer. So pretty big difference. Similar story for King George Whiting. Um, it's more coastally resolved, so it's really hard to see the change. But when you do calculate it across the state, the model that used the citizen science at the range edge increased an average suitability of 31 to 41%. So quite a substantial increase in suitability when you account for targeted um, occurrences at the range edge. So to sum up. Targeted citizen science programs improve the extent and volume of available data at the range edge considerably. And this was strongly due to the engagement with recreational fish fishers as they are critical for sustained data collection of key species at the range edge. And this improved resolution of occurrence at range edge increases habitat suitability estimates um, of SDMs. And there are two real take home messages that are kind of not really related, but I did want to mention them. Um, the first is cross-pollination between citizen science initiatives bolsters visibility and engagement across different user groups. So fishers and non-fishers could engage with either, either program and by um, advertising each program just in bolstered engagement across um, both, both initiatives. But for the nerds out there who love math and love modeling and love SDMs, I think this study is a bit of a word of caution when building these things. You really need to consider the resolution of your occurrence data at the range edge, especially when you're asking questions about range shifts and range limits, because when you do have improved resolution, it increases your estimates considerably. Thank you. Thanks, Alexia. No, certainly in Tassie, your King George Whiting fishery, the emerging fishery that you got down there is the envy of us uh, mainlanders. So I now welcome to the stage uh, Dr. Julian Hughes, um, who will now talk about factors affecting seabird abundance and interaction with nearshore for higher recreational charter fishery in New South Wales. 
Thank you very much. How do I get out of here? You go next. Go next. Oh, right. Terrific. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to present something a little bit different to the majority of the, the talks we've, we've heard this week. Um, it was really a sort of an unplanned opportunity that, that, we've, that I've taken advantage of to, to look at a, a big knowledge gap we have um, in, in our, what we know about seabird fishery interactions uh, being the, the interaction between um, seabirds and recreational fisheries. So, a first step to doing that is just to look at a small part of the New South Wales recreational fishery, the, the near shore for hire recreational charter fishery. And so seabirds and humans have competed for resources for literally thousands of years, and that's created direct interactions between seabirds and humans engaged in fishing, so fishers. Some interactions are benign or even beneficial, like uh, fishers using seabirds to locate fish. But by and large, most interactions involve seabirds being attracted to the foraging opportunities provided by fishers or vessels engaged in fishing, primarily feeding on discarded or escaped catch or fishing waste. So because of the attractiveness of fishes, fishes and fishing vessels to seabirds, more than 200 species of marine, marine and coastal birds have been recorded interacting with at least one type of fishing gear. So while fishing gear is specifically designed to catch fish, it also catches unintended species, including seabirds. Uh, and as these images show, bycatch of seabirds can result in substantial mortality. So as a result of the increasing size, harvest and spatial extent of modern commercial industrialised fishing fleets, seabirds now encounter a literally unprecedented diversity of gears and fishing intensity. And that's resulted in an inevitable increase in interactions between seabirds and fishers or vessels engaged in fishing and an inevitable increase in bycatch rates and mortality. So fishing's therefore identified as a threat to the conservation of a lot of um, vulnerable seabird populations. So the scale of interactions with, with major modern industrialised commercial fishing is really well documented and it's resulted in research into numerous operation and technical measures to um, minimise interaction by catching mortality of seabirds. So things like bird scaring lines in, in commercial trawl fisheries and fast sinking baits in uh, commercial longline fisheries. And many of these are now mandated by national and international fisheries regulations. So in contrast to what we know about the interactions between seabirds and commercial fisheries, we know almost nothing about the, the nature and extent of interactions between seabirds and recreational fisheries even though the magnitude of estimates of global recreational fishing effort is of a scale of hundreds of millions of people a year. So in areas where uh, participation in recreational fishing is high, even a really small number of interactions between seabirds and individual fishers may actually have an impact at, at the population level. So information on recreational fisher seabird interactions are really a massive knowledge gap in our overall understanding of, of the relationship between uh, seabirds uh, and fishing in general. So New South Wales, which is immediately north of, is the state immediately north of where we are now, uh, is a typical um, jurisdiction with a high uh, participation in recreational fishing with an estimated 850,000 to a million people, around 12% of the population participating in recreational fishing each year. Most effort occurs in um, estuarine and marine waters, is shore-based, but some effort also occurs from vessels in oceanic waters, including uh, a for hire near shore marine charter fishery. And the Southeast Australia has also been identified as a key foraging area for a high diversity of seabirds. So that combination of things means there's a high, uh, there's high potential for seabirds to interact with recreational fishers uh, in this part of the world. So the, four, the New South Wales Marine Charter Fishery is a for hire recreational fishery where operators take paying clients out to target various demersal and pelagic fish species in nearshore marine waters using typical recreational hook and line methods, most often, often uh, a paternoster rig. The fishery consists of around 80 operators working out of 36 ports uh, through the whole state 
and it's monitored by mandatory logbooks and also an onboard observer program. And this was the program that I was able to opportunistically use to look at uh, seabird interactions with this small component of the New South Wales fishery. So the specific aims were to quantify the level of interactions between seabirds and this fishery, and then to explore the factors that explore the factors that might influence the abundance of seabirds around the vessels and therefore their interactions uh, with the fishery. So data was collected by uh, onboard observers between October 2017 and September 2018 on 135 randomly selected charter trips out of 14 ports uh, on 31 different charter vessels between Swansea and Naruma, so between 33 and 36 degrees latitude, around 400 kilometres uh, of coast. And all birds within a within a, a radius of a circle of radius 500 metres were counted during a randomly selected five minute period during each fishing event. So each time the, the boat stopped to fish, the seabirds were counted um, for five minutes. They're identified to species where possible and where there were lots of birds uh, around the vessel, um, abundance was estimated. So all direct interactions were recorded for the entire time um, the charter the charter vessel was. Um, was engaged in fishing, and a direct interaction is any interaction uh, which could result in the seabird becoming bicaught. And then we also recorded factors that could affect the number of seabirds, and we collected, and we we decided on those factors based on um, the sorts of things that attract seabirds to commercial vessels. So we we collected time of year data, obviously, and then we collected a whole bunch of fishing operational data. So the total number of fish caught, the number of fish retained fish discarded, number of active fishes and time spent fishing. And then we also collected a bunch of environmental data that could potentially uh, influence the number of birds. So we collected sky condition information, wind speed and direction, and sea condition and direction. We then used linear mixed models to, to look at which factors sig were significant uh, in affecting the number of birds at charter vessels. We did this for all the seabirds recorded, as well as the three most uh, abundant families, so shearwaters, gulls and terns, and albatrosses. Uh, almost 400 individual observations were made, counting more than 3,000 seabirds in the vicinity of charter vessels, including several species of conservation concern, like this bullers albatross here. Um, Ten species were positively identified from seven families, including albatrosses, gulls, terns and skewers, pelicans, shearwaters and primes, penguins, gannets, and cormorants. Being in New South Wales, not surprisingly, the most common species identified was the silver gull. Uh, but as I just said before, the most common families encountered were shearwaters. They made up 70% of all the birds, 76% of all the birds counted, and were encountered on roughly 50% of trips. Uh, gulls and terns made up 10% of all the birds, but were encountered on only 8% of trips, and albatrosses made up 8% of the birds counted, but were encountered on more than 50% of trips. So in terms of factors affecting the, the number of birds um, season, so the time of year was significant for, um, for all seabirds. Uh, there was also where we found more birds overall in spring and summer than in um, autumn and winter, and this was driven by high seasonal abundances of shearwaters in spring and summer. Gulls and terns were showed the highest abundances in autumn and winter, and albatrosses uh, were also most abundant in autumn and winter. If we then look at the fishing variables, we see that none of the fishing variables uh, had a significant effect on the number of birds around charter vessels. So, so the, the number of fishes, the number of retained fish, the number of discarded fish, total number of fish, and total, total number of anglers, I think of or hours fished rather, had a, had a significant effect on the, on the number of birds. And this was, this was a surprise. Uh, and that applied to all birds, shearwaters, gulls and terns, and, and albatrosses. In terms of the environmental variables that we looked at, again, very few of these actually um, had a significant effect on the number of birds. The only environmental variable that did was, um, was sky condition, which um, which affected the number of shearwaters around charter vessels and therefore all seabirds combined. And we found more birds were present, significantly more birds were present during overcast or rainy weather than when weather was fine. In terms of interactions with charter vessels, only 16 direct interactions were recorded in over 630 hours 
of observed fishing. So albatrosses were the most common family recorded, uh, eating discards, removing uh, hooked fish or, or baits. Uh, pelicans were also recorded eating discards. Uh, and a single incident of bycatch occurred where a shearwater was recorded eating a baited hook before being released. So that enabled us to, to calculate um, rates of both direct interactions and bycatch, two and a half direct interactions per 100 hours of fishing, uh, and that single incidence of bycatch resulted in a bycatch rate of 0.16 events per 100 hours of fishing. So in terms of the factors affecting the number of birds attending charter vessels, season was significant, and this is consistent with summer and autumn breeding migrations of shearwaters to this part of the world. Uh, it's also consistent with the, the, um, the appearance of, well, the, the higher abundances that we see for gulls and terns and albatrosses in, in winter and spring. Surprisingly, all of the fishing variables were non-significant. And this is in, in contrast to a lot of work that's been done on commercial fisheries that's shown that the amount of fishing waste being released by the fishing vessels increases the abundance of seabirds. Um, so it's likely that the discard rate for released fish and bait from the charter fishery is not high or constant enough from charter vessels to attract and retain the birds. Um, the amount of time spent fishing also didn't increase the abundance of seabirds. And for many commercial fisheries, the amount of time spent trawling, long lining or, or gill netting has been shown to increase the number of seabirds. And this could be, again, uh, related to the amount of fishing waste being released. Um, sky condition was the only factor that significantly increased the number of birds. And this is consistent with some of the stuff we know about um, commercial, particularly long line fisheries where baited hooks have been shown to remain near the surface for longer periods during poor weather. And it's also likely a result of find the fact that finding natural prey during, during poor and meteorological conditions um, is more likely to attract the birds to vessels rather than um, looking for, for prey in the pelagic environment they would do naturally. Um, in terms of interactions with charter vessels, the low, the low rates suggest that the marine charter, charter fishery represents a re reasonably uh, low risk activity to seabirds in this region. In fact, if we scale it up to the entire New South Wales marine charter fishery, so statewide, the number of direct interactions uh, could be over 400 events per year with a bycatch of around 40 birds per year. Now, that, that may not seem like much, but if we scale, if we use our, our, um, our bycatch rate that we've estimated here to scale it up to the entire New South Wales boat-based recreational fishery, potential bycatch could be up to 1,800 birds per year. And that's quite a lot. With the very important caveat that not all boat-based fishing in oceanic waters using, uses the same gear as the New South Wales charter fishery. Uh, and, and those diversity of, of methods and gears may have very different gear seabird interaction profiles. So the use of lures, for example, is likely to have a very different seabird interaction profile than using bait. But the real contrast with commercial fisheries is in mortality rates. So recreational fishers use comparatively light gear, which is also often actively fished. So the gear can be immediately retrieved if a seabird begins interacting with it. Even if a bird is hooked or entangled, it can be ameliorated much more quickly than in a commercial uh, setting. Most commercial fisheries that have been identified to pose a threat to seabirds, so things like long lining and trawling, are not ones where the behavior of the individual fisher can minimise interactions to the extent that can occur in recreational fisheries. So if these albatross start interacting with this recreational fisher's bait, um, it can be reasonably easily uh, kept out of their way. But if any of these seabirds start interacting with the trawl cables, the warp cables on this trawler, it's very hard for the skipper to, uh, to do anything about it. So this study has really been a first step in the assessment of seabird interactions with recreational fishery. It's also shown that interactions with recreational fisheries are likely to be extremely rare events requiring enhanced and ongoing monitoring. So onboard observer programs like the, the program that provided the data for this study, uh, questions in creel surveys about interactions between fishers and seabirds, questions in off-site surveys, uh, and potentially the development of new monitoring programs. Um, this study has also highlighted the need for recreational fishers to be aware of best practice protocols for handling and releasing bycaught seabirds. There's a lot of good uh, online resources uh, that are very useful, and that's just a couple of examples there. 
Uh, but most importantly, um, the key take home message has, is that monitoring of seabird interactions with recreational fishes needs to have an increase and ongoing focus, particularly in areas of high participation rates in recreational fishing because a very small number of individual interactions between fishes and seabirds potentially has population level impacts for the seabirds. Uh, and just in closing, I'd like to acknowledge the, the charter operators who hosted the observers, uh, our observers, Charter Fishing New South Wales Working Group, who have been very supportive of this work, the New South Wales Recreational Fishing Trust um, for funding this work. There's a, there's a pa published paper with, with much more detailed information than I presented with you here today. Um, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Dr. Hughes. I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Lucas King, a PhD, a postdoctoral fellow from the University of Massachusetts, who's going to talk to us about the uh, pretty impressive Atlantic carp on. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's see where we start. Um, ever since being here in Australia, everyone's always saying, oh, this is the best Melbourne. This is the best place to go fishing. This is definitely the best fish to go catch, uh, the Atlantic tarpon. It's incredibly important economically uh, and also culturally as well, especially in the southeastern part of uh, the states. But over time, uh, there's been suspected uh, declines in their population numbers. Uh, they have quite a big distribution, but today I'll just be focusing about uh, the Gulf of Mexico and the southeast U.S. We don't have a harvest here. Uh, when there is a bit of a harvest, it's just for trophy. Um, but that means there's lots of catch and release practices being done, uh, which we are concerned about because there's a lot of improper, or I should say, not the best practices of catch and release. We have issues of shark predation if you were in the depredation session yesterday. Habitat loss and water quality are really big ones and what we're focusing on more and more. And then the forage fish declines, that's an emerging threat for this fishery. So before we understand uh, the best management and conservation practices, we have to understand the basic biology of these fish and how they encounter their threats, especially for a big and migratory fish like this. They're late maturing, uh, about 12 years, and you know they live upwards of 50, 60, even 70 years old. So we took the approach of every fish tells a story. Uh, we're using acoustic telemetry so you can catch those juveniles, we can catch some the large uh, females as well, almost the size of me. Um, and these transmitters have a battery life of upwards of five, even sometimes six years. So we can understand these movement tracks over many seasons, which is a really big benefit of this technology. So we took a bit of a crazy approach here. We thought we'd track this fish uh, thousands of kilometers potentially. Um, we wanted to understand the connectivity, so we tagged in these red boxes here. So we want to understand the connectivity across the Gulf of Mexico and then also the southeast U.S. And on the right, you'll see uh, a really neat animation of interpolations. Calendar date is up on the upper left. Every year is in a different color. Every dot is a different tarpon. So here in August, you can see them all the way up. Many of them are in their temperate areas. These are areas of high productivity, estuarine habitats with lots of biomass, and they're coming down south to overwinter. So then they'll remain here for until the months of like March, April, May, and then once June rolls around, they return up towards north. So those months are really the primary spawning period for these fish. So there's a lot of data I could show you, but we wanted to take a different approach. We, we modeled every migratory behavior of every fish. So getting away from the, just the descriptive stats, we wanted to understand the population level estimates of all their movement strategies. So of course we have month on the bottom, latitudes on the y-axis. So you can think of 24 being that beautiful tropical water, that dark 
uh, brown water is around 36. As you go up north, it's more productive systems, again, that biomass. So these fish, you can see all these lines is each fish over that five or six years tracking period. And so we run these models, we can extract a bunch of interesting information. Here, I'm just representing that we can understand when they do their migrations at the population level. So in the spring, we understand that's around June and July. And then when they're coming back south, that's that September and November period. Um, and as you can tell, there's a lot of different movement strategies among tarpon. There's a bit of partial migration being exhibited here. But on the individual level, if you take all these movement parameter estimates and look at their repeatability from year to year, you actually get a very consistent pattern. They're migrating around the same time every year for the same duration. Um, they're spending upwards of four months in their northern latitudes in the same locations year after year. So getting to the connectivity here, um, what's the connectivity across these two regions? Uh, we did a network analysis. So just the basics is this abstract um, attraction repulsion graph here. Every dot here is a different tarpon. The more places you visit that's similar to other tarpon, you get grouped into that area. So the blue is all Gulf of Mexico uh, side, and the orange is that southeast side. Um, so we ran a community detection algorithm, and indeed there's quite a bit of a division between those two areas. There are some fish that cross between, but for the most part, these are divided subgroups, except for the Florida Keys, which is on the very tip of Florida, right here. And this is the area where they're all migrating, or many, I should say, are migrating south, um, and they stage here, and then they move offshore to spawn. So there's a lot of mixing here. This is an important location we'll revisit in a moment. But again, how do we apply this to management directly? Um, so obviously there's a lot of con connectivity going past those jurisdictional areas, uh, whether you're going to the Gulf of Mexico or up the southeast U.S. Uh, we have different harvest limits. Uh, in red, you can keep as many tarpon as you want. Yellow depends on size and number. And then we have our catch and release, which would be Florida, the uh, capital fishing of the world, the best place to go fishing. Uh, and then Virginia, far north, is so very proactive up there. With this data, we were able to make a catch and release amendment for stud in North Carolina with angler support, which is exciting. Uh, but again, this is a mostly catch and release fishery. So actually Florida is the only place, a uh, certain size of a fish around 40 inches, you can't lift it up out of the water. And because this is such an energetically expensive uh, behavior, all these migrations, this is what we're gonna be moving up towards is encouraging education uh, within the state level and then also regulation as well around catch and release. So returning down to that substantial mixing location, uh, the Florida Keys, that very tropical water, um, we wanted to take a closer look because it's obviously very important for the population. We can drill in to exactly when they're arriving, when they're departing. We had all, a lot of these acoustic receiver arrays where we're monitoring their movements and the white dots. The thicker green lines are those sort of what we can think of migration corridors, those highways. That's where a lot of angling pressure is. These fish are staying around 50 days. And so there's a lot of intensive fishing happening here in those 50 days. And interesting, we found that they're re really repeatable when they're arriving to the Keys every year. So again, kind of like the repeatability on the broad scale level, they're actually very repeatable here coming to these free spawning aggregation locations. Even if they overwinter in December one year, that same fish will return the next December. Conversely, if a fish shows up in that main uh, migration phase in the first or second week of April, it's gonna do the same in the next uh, year. So that kind of goes back to the catch and release education aspect because we're fishing the same group of fish every year. So again, angling and handling is gonna be critical, especially in this location before they move offshore to spawn and then do these long distance migrations. Of course, boat traffic, this is a lot of jet skis in the area and other anglers. Um, so again, thinking about those migration corridors and then water quality and habitat protection. Uh, this is a really big one in Florida. It's an ecological crisis all across Florida. Um, we have issues with the Everglades, which is just north. Um, but to expand on this, we'll jump to another case study on the west side of Florida. Uh, we have a big lake in the middle. There's a lot of discharge. These nutrients are fueling harmful algal blooms. Here's red tide. This is the, the one we're most concerned about, Carina brevis. You can clearly guess which area is the red tide. Uh, and then if a fish or a manatee or really any of these marine organisms encounter it, they can suffer mortality. So we wanted to dig into this and see if it's a huge issue for this fishery or not. So we interviewed expert fishing guides that have been in the area for multiple decades uh, to see their opinions, what they observed, what were the changes. We use acoustic telemetry, of course, 
And then that far right one is representative. We actually worked with tournament data looking at how catch rates changed based on these harmful algal bloom presences or absences. So of course, we saw that blooms are increasing during peak tarpon season. This was really reinforced with the, the knowledge, the, the local ecolog ecological knowledge of these fishing guides. And when tarpon are in, uh, encountering this, there are fish kills. We do document where those occur. Um, the, probably the biggest concern here, though, is the reproduction uh, success of these fish. We know this red tide affects reproduction success, even at the, end of, uh, the adult level but also at the larvae level, right, when those larvae coming back in to recruit. Um, and then the fishery impacts. Again, this is a multi-hundred million dollar fishing industry. As these harmful algal blooms are present in the area, catching rates decrease. So it's gonna be a bigger and bigger an issue. Um, and really, this is hopefully leveraging the evidence to support we need to reduce the nutrient discharge in these areas that are pretty problematic. Uh, if you saw my, uh, well, colleagues talk, Grace Gasselberry I gave yesterday, who couldn't be here. Uh, we also looked at predator-prey interactions uh, before they move offshore to spawn. They get in these big schools of, of thousand plus fish. They're much easier to catch here. And obviously the, the sharks are learning this as well. And so we have these depredation events and potentially high levels of post-release mortality. So again, focusing on that pre uh, spawning aggregation location, the Florida Keys before they move offshore to spawn. We want to look at, well, are these sharks actually overlapping, uh, not just in space, but in time? So we aggregated the different receivers that you saw in white earlier. And then the yellow is the tarpon detections. The blue are the uh, hammerhead detections. When they overlap, they are grayish. And then for full sharks, it's red. And when they overlap, it's orangish. So you can see the size is kind of reflective of how many detections there are. But we want to take a step further, and we want to look at is it non-random movements by these sharks in different locations where they're actively arriving to places where they're already tarpon or not there? So are these shark encounters random or non-random? And there was a handful of different places that they were non-random, uh, but the most overlaps that occurred and also this non-random behavior uh, was in this one location. Uh, again, this was a uh, talk yesterday about Bay of Honda. Um, again, it's one of the more popular fishing locations here. And Grace Castleberry, for her dissertation work, sat on this old bridge, counted how many depredation events were occurring, and it was around 15% at a minimum uh, for all fish that were fought over five minutes. And that's, again, very concerning for a late maturing fish with a suspected declining population before they're even able to release those millions of eggs offshore. And again, cryptic post-release mortality is unknown uh, right now, which is the next phase of our project. Again, catch and release education. Uh, here, tackle recommendations. You want to be able to land that fish as fast as possible, but also be able to break it off uh, within that nine-minute range when depredations are most likely to occur. And then also, we're going to be exploring uh, potential shark deterrent approaches as well uh, and seeing their effectiveness not just here, but in other pre-spawning aggregation locations like that in uh, Charlotte Harbor, that southwest Florida area that I was talking about earlier. So just returning back to the threats and solutions, uh, we also administered a survey to around a thousand, well, I guess we, thousands of anglers we administered it to, but only a thousand took it, but we were very excited about that as quite a rich data for us. And we asked them, how is the fishing quality? How is the perceived population abundance going? You can see there's a lot more dark red here. And so a lot of anglers think there is a declining uh, fishing quality and population status for tarpon. And most of these are much more older, uh, are more experienced anglers in the fishery. So we also asked them about top priorities, catch and release regulations, strict handling guidelines, great for us, increase in tarpon research, and that water and habitat quality advocacy. And kind of the take home messages, a lot of the data I showed here was driven by the questions that were asked by the angling community and the management concerns. So we're going to keep working with the angling community to leverage the data set here to focus on those top priorities. Um, so these are all the fishing guides that helped tag those 200 tarpon uh, across those five or six different regions. Uh, that was a massive endeavor. A lot of inroads had to be made, a lot of trust building. We could probably give a whole other talk on this aspect, uh, working with the fishing guides. What really wonderful um, folks. Uh, and we also had corporate sponsors, multiple uh, academic partners, NGOs, and tracking a migratory species using acoustic telemetry uh, is quite difficult. So we relied on a lot of 
um, acoustic receiver networks uh, to share those detection data. Um, I do have a couple minutes left, so I do just want to mention that habitat and water um, quality concern and forage fish declines. So our next project right now, we are actually working with anglers to take fin clips to look at stable isotope uh, work to understand that forage fish and make a resource landscape. Um, and so kind of targeting those Menahaden fisheries, this uh, small forage fish that they really rely on, they're migrating very far distances for. So that's the next step in this project. With that, uh, I think we'll do a big Q&A, yeah? Sure. All right, thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Alexia, Julian, and Lucas. And look, if we get our three um, speakers up to the front of the stage for a Q&A session, um, I think we'd all be pretty happy if uh, the next fishing conference was in Florida. <laughs> um, has that been in Florida before? It has, I will. Again. So, does anyone have any questions for these are our fantastic three presenters? Yeah, I'll just direct one to Lucas straight away. I'm, I'm actually going to Florida in June. And um, uh, so just for yourself, Lucas, so uh, I'm going over to Florida to chase tarpon in June this year. I've been once before in the lower keys. Um, and a friend of mine who I'm going to be fishing with is working out of Jupiter. Um, have you, because that fishery apparently um, is fairly new as far as the tarpon migration goes. Like it, it was like only a decade ago, apparently there was no one fishing for tarpon there. But now they are. Um, is that we were watching one earlier there about um, climate change and that as well as changing the migration of these fish? Is there any reason or knowledge as to why these fish are now maybe going further up the coast? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so there's always been tarpon in uh, the Jupiter area. Now it's just much easier to catch them. And so there's a bit more of an angler culture there. Typically it was the Boca Grande and then the Lower Keys fishery. And so not just in Jupiter area, which is like right here, um, the fishery is expanding rapidly all the way up to South Carolina. And the furthest detection we had actually from tarpon from, was in New Jersey, which is absolutely mind boggling if you're familiar with the US. Um, and so we, we asked a question in the survey as well about climate change. And people are saying that the fish are arriving earlier and earlier. Um, and these anglers are moving up their charter businesses as well up into the north areas. But there's a wonderful species distribution modeling on cobia as well, um, which looked at um, climate change effects and the range expansion. But I'll definitely be taking some cues on that because that's future work we'll be doing. Yeah. I'll ask a question, yeah. <laughs> uh, for the species distribution modeling, <laughs> um, for those edge areas, do you balance specificity or sensitivity, or do you weight those observations at all, or is it like you can kind of train those models right to have false accuracies or false negatives, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, what we did, we didn't do any testing and weighting because the the values that came out were pretty good, so on, yeah. it was spot on. I mean, they were quite basic SDMs. There's two predictors, depth, which doesn't change, temperature, which does change, you know, shallower, more likelihood of occurrence, warmer, more likelihood of occurrence. So I think the more complicated you get, the more you can apply those weightings, but we, we didn't need to, we were pretty lucky. <laughs> Yeah, it's the mullet schools. I mean, the bullet fishery kind of starts in the fall when they're all coming out of the estuaries and going down south. Um, but it's really the Menahaden fishery, and there is definitely issues with climate change. But right now, we have a massive overharvest where the populations have declined over 90% since their historic abundance. And all these freshwater inputs are being um, dammed up as well, so it's a huge issue for those juveniles. 
And that's why we're looking at that sort of stable isotope approach. Um, so I, those are the two biggest ones for us, but certainly climate change is going to be a big one for those forage fish. You know? And the harvest, is that commercial harvest or, or is it, it also environmental? It's all commercial harvest. So fish oil pills, that's all uh, Louisiana and uh, Chesapeake Bay. Uh, they used to use it for fertilizer. It's in a lot of cosmetic products. They actually have their own quota systems. So actually there's no management body. Uh, they decide how much they want to harvest. Uh, so it's this crazy, crazy system with that particular species, yeah. Well, I might ask a question for Julian. Oh, yes. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was quite relatively low um, interactions with seabirds in the initial charter fishery. Were the observations taken in mainly the Mersal uh, charter sector, or, or was there trawling in some of those interactions? Yeah, no, just, just in the, the near shore charter fishery, so the, the sort of the big cattle boats, we call them. You can fit you know, up to 20 people on board and they primarily target demersal species. A little bit of trolling, but primarily snapper, moorwong, various wrasses, ocean leather jackets, <laughs> stuff like that. And on, and on a side note, um, whilst you were investigating seabirds, uh, was there any interactions with uh, marine mammals that you saw? Yeah, there were. So I didn't present any of that, but we collected that data as well. Seals were the worst. Yeah, so there are lots of interactions with seals, lots of depredation events, lots and lots, particularly in that, that southern region where we conducted that study. Yeah, so more of a comment, really, and I'm sorry I missed your talk with Ron Cody, but it um, seems to me what's happening, from my memory of oceanography on that part of the US coastline, you've basically got that, uh, the, the, Gulf, the Gulf Stream sort of moving up there. Um, it's very analogous to what we're seeing off East Australia where those Warm water currents moving to the South Pole down here, but the North Pole up there are kind of yep. increasing in the projections. So what we're seeing is the animals in the ocean boat, the bait fish and the predators kind of kind of moving that as a natural matter of course. So hopefully not in our lifetime, but you can ima imagine you're going to see all those things right up, you know, north of New York, etc., etc. That's just the way it is, and that's the deal with the climate change thing. We probably can't kind of change it kind of quickly anyway. So mm -hmm. uh, I think what we're tracking is these changes in natural populations that can move uh, just to respond to where the water conditions they want and uh, bait and the fish are. So the interesting thing will be whether tarpon will be <laughs> spawning in these areas of Florida in hundreds of years time or whether they're found somewhere further north because that's kind of yeah. a, a, a hypothesis that's going to happen. Right? So. To speak to the, the Gulf Stream, uh, here's Cape Canaveral where NASTA is. And it's just like jetting sort of part of the land. And the Gulf Stream goes up along Jupiter, hits that, and it goes up here, but right along the coast. And then the, it goes from like Spartina estuaries and then to mangroves at this boundary line. And so this is a huge hot spot for all these species, and it's a really important area. But other folks with the acoustic pulling tree are seeing that animals are not returning to here. But this is because it's a really important though, because you can just go a little bit north, a little bit south to have that perfect habitat suitability. But some animals are not making it all the way down south because of uh, suspected like physiological consequences. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like a similar sort of current stream. Yeah. I'm just add on that because I was interested in the predation of the tarp and with the shark. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it's an emerging topic that Gary and I and John and yeah, there's a lot of folks looking into it now. And that's, and that's happening there with the as well? Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. When we try to tag the hammerheads, we actually turn on the engine and rev it a couple times and then it's like, they'll come up to the surface. Yeah. Lucas, what sort of gear restrictions are you? 
management is looking at, you know, is it a oh, yeah. flying class for like fly rods or is it, you know? No, one's, no one has any management. Uh, it's more of a cultural thing. So the fly guides will be going to lower and lower class weights, or sorry, lines. And then, so they just break it off after jumping them a couple times. But a lot of people from the Midwest in the U.S. come down to the Keys and they want to catch a big tarpon. And so a lot of them has never really fought a big fish either. So they have heavy tackle and they kind of just hold it like this. And that's when we have big issues as well. So it's part the guides have to decide when to break off that fish. It's part of uh, the cultural change to just jump the fish because they jump a lot and then be happy with that and not actually hmm. handle it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so a big part of the uh, tarp on a bonefish trust is kind of uh, maintaining habitat or improving habitat for these species. In Definitely. The Bahamas and now Mexico and whatever. Um, so what do we know about the early life stages of the tarp on the product from the spawn and something before? And you made it clear that you've got water quality issues coming off the land, if you like. Do they use some of those mangroves and lagoon areas at yeah. the early stages? And yeah, so there's early stages and they're there for upwards of 12 years. And they're in the back back water areas where there's no oxygen. That's why they gulp. They can gulp, and that's how they avoid the predators when they're younger. And so they're all the way back in here, and then that's where the people like to have golf courses, or maybe they just think of that as a swamp. But those are all juvenile tarpon habitat. So for at the juvenile level, those estuaries are really important. And then on the adult level, the red tide events that we have, um, the Everglades on the south part of Florida are getting starved from fresh water. And so all these seagrass beds are dying off. Um, where we're thinking about habitat mostly for the adults though, is those more northern locations with the freshwater plumes, those dams that are not just important for tarpon, but the, the forage fish that they focus on. Because up north, when there's a drought, all the anglers will go to the rivers because that's where the productivity, the biomass for those fish are. And so those freshwater inputs are extremely important. Yeah. And the places that have dams and hypersalinity, the tarpon don't show up there anymore. Give a round of applause for our three presenters. Um, <laughs> three very different presentations, but um, yeah, fantastic. Really appreciate it. So that's the end of the sessions in this room. Um, there are a few more going around this place. So um, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. We're back home when we. Uh...